opportunity for them to make their uh, communities a better place. Um, from the capacity building side, if you will, on the teacher side, um, Henrietta is, has been one of our teachers who's been with us for a long time and um, teaching about electronics, for example, and just hands-on science was a difficulty for her. But because we had been, we had given them the training um, and they had been able to share, um, they, uh, they, they not only build their own confidence and ability to teach, but also uh, build the capacity of the other people um, and teachers in, in their schools to teach, which I'll mention in a minute. So what we had really thought about, you know, in terms of our goals is also, you know, how do we provide and be partner in providing quality education and of course also gender equality. So the exploratory we have, uh, I'll tell you later again, we have about 750 students that we work with and about 85% um, of them are girls. Um, and we work in uh, the public schools in Ghana, primarily in uh, lower resourced areas. And, um, and I will also talk about that uh, in a minute. And, um, and we work with about four different districts and about seven, uh, 19 different schools. Uh, that was not the case at the beginning. For a long time, we really only worked with four schools in one district uh, where we worked. So you can ask me why I <laughs> decided to go to Ghana. And uh, one of the reasons is, frankly, as someone coming from the US, uh, Ghana is uh, an English speaking um, district and uh, country and uh, and um, they're relatively politically stable. So uh, there were there was two incentives. And the other reasons um, that is listed here are the reasons that we decided that uh, it would be beneficial to work in Ghana, in addition to the community uh, conversations that we had with teachers and educators themselves, right? So um, when I started working in Ghana, so, and this uh, these stats also from 2016, um, there's a lack of qualified teachers, right? Um, and so there's a lot of equipment. So, and um, so between the two, education means that there's a lot of rote learning, right? Everything is like, I'll write something on the board, you memorize these terms, you memorize these facts, and you regurgitate it during, during, um, during your exams. And then, okay, great. Um, and then there's nothing to teach with, right? Our teachers, when we've talked to them, they're like, ah, everything is what they call abstract, right? So, um, but they, the teachers that we worked with and talked with firmly understand the importance of having equipment, right? And materials to, for them to do their work. And um, as you can see in the bottom, only 24% of uh, women, um, of those who are in STEM are women. And part of it is a lot to, to gender expectations in the country, but also there's a lack of awareness of career opportunities. So that was one, re one of the other reasons that we're interested in working there. So, um, so because of these uh, need, understanding of needs, uh, when we went, uh, we approached our work in three different ways, right? One is thinking about, you know, how we could provide ongoing professional development for our teachers. Um, and then um, for the students themselves to how we introduce hands-on learning to them without being able to provide the entire school uh, with the materials, right? Because we are a small nonprofit, we can't do that. So the way that we approach that is, ah, okay, we will actually create these after-school clubs that will train some teachers who are already really interested, who can actually then work with uh, young people. And then we do provide. And while we say that, you know, we're working with these teachers for these clubs to provide and provide um, learning materials. At the end of the day, those learning materials are actually available to the entire school. And what we have found is that um, teachers and two things happen and you will see in the impact. So while we say we work with about 700 kids, the impact is actually the, the broadness of the school, which would probably be 2,500 to 3,000 students because of two things. One, the teachers who have been trained with us, um, other teachers often tap them and say, can you actually come and do that experiment or do that demo in my class so that my students can see it? Or if the teachers are more confident, uh, for example, junior high 
school teachers who are oftentimes have a background in science, they might come to our teachers and say, hey, can I borrow the equipment so that I can actually do this experiment or demo, et cetera, in my classroom, right? So those are teachers that we don't directly interact with, but who, who will benefit. Um, so I'll talk about the other things that we do, hopefully with some more fun pictures at the end. Um, so this uh, it's just another rendering and model of what we think about uh, our longer term outcomes are. Uh, let me do the pointer thing here. So, you know, the clubs are what we do. That's sort of like the basis of what we are um, working on. And that's only possible when we actually have good facilitator training. And that allows us not only to build um, uh, uh, curiosity and confidence within the young people that we work with, but actually with the facilitators and our teachers as well, right? And again, you know, uh, we provide the kits so that they can um, they can do the work. And you know, one can think about inspirational and um, equitable learning spaces as actual like labs, but in fact, you know, any educational space um, could be that where um, where teachers and students come together, and sometimes actually when students themselves come together. So, um, okay, I'm gonna go to the next. Stop me anytime if I'm going too fast. So this is just um, a. a map of you know where we work right so Ghana again is a West African country um, surrounded by a lot of francophone countries and um, they also just had their election <laughs> and the country with all the peaceful transitions uh, that we have seen so these uh, this is Ghana right here right outlined here and we really only work in the very coastal regions and um, this is a zoom in of that area and where our school sites are. So we're in Accra, which is um, again, you know, the capital of Ghana. But again, we work in mostly um, lower resourced uh, government schools. Uh, we have a cluster in Pokwasi, which uh, over the last 10 years have developed from a, a peri urban area to a reasonably actually re um, almost middle class or at least part of it middle class uh, bedroom community, if you will, for Accra. And then we have a collaboration over here in Berkuso, which is where uh, Ashesi University is, which some of you may know, um, and which developed because uh, we have a partner who was uh, working uh, with the schools there. And the expansion also to uh, Ensawam, which is where our um, other sites are, also as a result of our uh, of a collaboration. Also, chance meetings. <laughs> well, like you know, somebody that I met at a UN meeting, and she said, "Hey, I run this program for girls, and I pay their school fees." And I've talked to teachers there, and they think that they they've told us that science education is what they really want. So, can we collaborate? So we said, "Yes, absolutely." So that's how that uh, that expansion happened. Collaborations are great. Uh, yeah. you know, they don't happen. They don't happen enough. And I think this, this is great that you're you you were able to do that. <laughs> yeah, and 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 that's an approach that we take to ex expansion, if you will, which is that you know we we in this case are the technical partners, if you will, right? And those uh, other organizations have community relationships. So schools educators, the community already trust them. And so we don't have to actually do all that hard work um, of building, uh, uh, establishing ourselves and building trust, which is really hard to do. Um, so these are just, you know, a couple of our kids in action. We have like the little cute notebooks, um, which I should, oh, right here that we use. And over time, what one of the things that we're really trying to do is Hey, how, so these are all, you know, African scientists and um, well, okay, that's um, Catherine Johnson actually. Um, and then, you know, just really g giving them a chance to like, hey, these are the people, these are your people and you can see yourselves, right? We're thinking about um, uh, representation. And, um, and then, yeah, as you see, we, we give them things as simple as, you know, magnifying glasses or as complicated as microscopes, because um, even though they're gen generally resource poor areas, they also deserve to have um, uh, nice equipment, if you will. So um, I'm, 
I'm happy to answer more questions about the clubs later, but I want to uh, talk a little bit about uh, some of the other things that we have done, uh, one of which is a design challenge that we've created. So uh, what we have seen is that um, the kids are really excited. They, you know, they learn about uh, anything from, you know, body systems to, uh, as you see, um, the environment, uh, they have a physics curriculum, some with chemistry. And over time we said, you know, how do we get our kids who are at all these places uh, excited and thinking about how they could apply what they have learned in science to community problems, right? So uh, what we have done in the last two or three years is actually created a design challenge which we call Solve for Ghana. Right. So initial, so we have done this about three rounds and we do it always in, uh, in partnership. So the goal is to ask, uh, we usually identify the community problem for them and then uh, ask them to expand on it. And then uh, they actually work then in teams, sometimes that are inter-school teams that are randomly <laughs> created. Um, in, and then um, they have a final that they attend. The last few years, one of the design challenges has been about, you know, uh, light, right? They, for a long time, uh, they have had um, intermittent uh, power shortages. So we said, hey, you've had an entire electronics curriculum this last year, learned about, you know, circuits, etc. cetera. Um, let's pose a problem to you, which is that, well, often uh, the light goes out and you still need to study and do homework. So what can be done? So uh, the, 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 they went about, some of them trying to create like, you know, solar powered cells, either for the community. Uh, some of them presented ideas around using uh, chemically based um, batteries. Um, some of them use the, the materials that were provided for them to, in this case, create the light that not only come, have light coming from one side, but because they study together, have light that are coming out from four different sides so that they can actually go and work together. And this is a particularly interesting story because yes, the person down here is Angela Merkel. <laughs> and uh, this is a partnership that uh, we, had, uh, we had with um, Dex Technology. So Prince says here is the person who actually designed this uh, light box up here. And uh, her story is that um, I used to have to go to my friend's house all the time because they have electricity right? Uh, whereas I live in this building that is not finished, but I have now, but when the electricity goes out for all of us, I can't actually study. None of us can study either. So she's designed this light box and when the electricity goes out, now they can come to her house to actually study. And so our partner at Dex Technologies, Charles um, Ofori, amazing guy, um, presented this uh, at one of his uh, um, interactions, if you will, uh, with the public and both uh, brought uh, Prince there and introduced this idea to the German prime minister. <laughs> so that's one. Um, subsequent uh, design challenges have been around like, okay, you have also learned about body systems. So for the primary kids, imagine that you have to design something for, uh, to tell your community for those who are um, illiterate, right? Um, about the, the impact of smoking. So build a 3D model that can actually illustrate the effect of secondhand smoke. And for the older kids, we, we say a similar challenge, but hey, a public health person has come in um, uh, to, to talk to your community. Again, you know, they need something that is, uh, that, is, um, that is material in order to share with older members of your community about, you know, these health problems. Can you help them create uh, an artifact? So the kids definitely jumped to the, uh, rise, rose up to the challenge. Um, um, so let me go back then, therefore, you know, this is some of the uh, ideas from the first challenge with, you know, there's no light, there's doom saw, which is this word, on, off is what it means. Um, so some kids actually created a, uh, um, 
wind turbine as a as an idea. Some kids created again, like I said, a, a chemically based um, uh, battery system, etc. And here's another light example. How much time do you give them to come up with these uh, ideas? Uh, they have they meet they come together at about 9 a.m. in the morning. We give them a little, you know, overview of what the challenge is, uh, the, especially in the first time we gave them some tools around thinking about problem uh, identification and uh, and brainstorming. And then they, including lunch, right, they have about two o'clock to come up with a draft, right? So basically they don't come up with um, the, the, the prototype right away. So they come up with an idea and then they present it and then those that get selected in the following week, they come together. So there's probably only like eight to 10 groups that come together. And then they have another day to build a semi-working prototype for, uh, for the design. So it sounds like they, they pitch. The first day is like come yeah. up with an idea, pitch, and they get selected. And then the yeah. following week, they come back. Those are selected to continue building. Exactly. Um, on their ideas. Yeah. Cool. Uh, there's a question in the chat here um, from Gabriela. What are the incentives to participate? Um, for the students or for the teachers? I guess both. Yeah, for the students, um, really because it's fun and or their friends come. Uh, we have a semi-selection process where, because there's actually a lot of uh, interest in participating. Um, and, um, and so we actually have the teachers go and identify uh, students who not only those and not not especially those who are already doing well in science, right? We said who might actually benefit from um, doing hands-on. And of course, you know, because we have a focus on girls as well, um, that's the other selection. Um, their continued attendance actually is, um, is important for, their, for them to come back the following year. Um, and uh, for the teachers, initially we had provided stipends for them for, uh, for because this is an after-school opportunity, but over time and because of resource constraints on our part, especially as we were expanding, uh, we 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 provided to them some incentive when they came to the training, and also then the in other incentive for them is actually they have the materials that we provide for them. Got it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, okay, so. I don't know why the top is not filled, but but what students also do in this case is now they they have the capacity to actually identify problems in their community, right? So this group um, went around and say, you know what? We have these ladies who sell food at the tuck shops over there, and we like to eat over there. And some community members come, but there are never enough chairs to sit. So as an end of year sort of give back to the community project, what they actually did was um, collected some money and solicited some uh, uh, waste materials, if you will. So those yellow jerry cans are sort of available. Um, and then they brought some nails and some board and they put together and, you know, designed and redesigned and created a few benches that they presented to these ladies who, are, uh, who sell food to them. So uh, it, it um, yeah, so anyway, so, oh, there you go. These are the other uh, models that they had built around, you know, the body. Okay. All right, so the other thing that um, in terms of capacity is thinking about, you know, how we can leverage what we, uh, people that we know here in the US, right, and elsewhere, so that we can actually um, provide more, uh, whether it's materials or training to the teachers uh, who, are, who are there. Um, so as I had mentioned, uh, Charles, sorry that I've covered his face, <laughs> is an incredible inventor and uh, really community minded. So he has started a company um, called Dex Technologies with another friend. So as you see here, you in the beginning when we used to teach electronics, it's, you know, myself and you know volunteers etc sorry um who sat around and like cut wires and go to the go to the market and buy you know nails and 
pack together tinfoil, et cetera, and put it into a little packet and give it to our teachers, right? Um, obviously, this we all know that this is a common problem. And Charles's solution to this problem was actually create what he called a, a lab on a desk, right? Lab in a box. So it's a science set that uh, he started a company to create. And because we were able to get a grant from uh, the Australian government, uh, we actually became one of the first sort of investors, <laughs> major investors in his science set. So that both um, allowed our teachers and our students to actually have access to these materials, certainly reduce the manual labor <laughs> that we had and uh, to, to create them, but also helped uh, um, Charles and Dex launch their business. And now they're actually selling their stuff here. They won a major awards. In addition to the electronic set that you have seen here, they have since created um, other kits around, you know, robotics, about vertical farming, about green energy, et cetera. So, um, so we're quite excited about that. And some of our teachers themselves have become trainers for Dext as well. So because they're, um, and this is a very affordable kit that teachers feel like they can actually buy one for themselves. Um, and uh, many uh, even, you know, you don't have to be a high income parent to be able to afford this kit for uh, for for your students. Um, Charles's dream is, you know, every student, just like you have a set of, you know, rulers, they have a math kit that they have to buy that, you know, all students will have access to this. And we're excited about that. Um, it's a question uh, from Rosaria, and I, I, I too have this question as well. Yes. Um, in terms of partnership development, right, how do you how do you build these partnerships and or uh, how have you been able to develop these relationships? I think it's really hard to, to develop them, right? And, and maintain them. That's a whole different question. How do you start them and how do you maintain them? So any insight there? Mm -hmm. um, I, so let me maybe finish the next two slides and I'll answer this question. Great. So that you get a, a, the breath. Um, this is another, uh, um, idea that we had, right, which is there's, um, there's a, basically a server called Rachel, which I, I have one here, and thinking about, you know, how do we have, how do we get teachers and students to be able to access the, the abundance of free learning materials, right, that are around, and they're called, um, it, it's basically a remote server, right? A remote area community hotspot. And um, again, we got a grant to do this. We were confident about bringing this to them because we also have um, World Possible is the organization that develops this because uh, of networking, partly. <laughs> uh, we identified a couple of people who actually uh, have been working in technology uh, for a long time. And one another uh, young person who was also a, a, a Ghanaian who is affiliated with World Possible, who, is a, who has already been using this material. So uh, we established a relationship with them. So he, in effect, became a consultant to us as to, to train teachers to be able to, to do this work. Um, and then the third area is uh, we have a relationship with a couple of universities here. One is Wellesley College. STEM Kit was is actually a uh, an organization, college group that was developed um, at Wellesley University by a couple of students, and we've had interns from them the last three, not this past summer, uh, but the previous three summers, who have gone over to test their materials and to develop their materials. And uh, we also have a relationship with um, Olin College of Engineering. They have a class called Affordable Design and Entrepreneurship. And they also have a relationship with another amazing um, organization called Agastia. And where, you know, I don't know if you remember from physics, you have these light boxes that shines like parallel light rays out and you put a lens and then you see like how the rays change. Uh, depending on the convexity or whatever of the lens. So they used to have like a really clunky machine. And we've worked with these students to think about like, hey, can we make something that is actually either paper-based, right? Where you have this slits here, you can drop your lens in here and do the same thing or a more robust model, right? So, um, so to now to the answer your question, right? Um, how do we build them? Partly, again, it's 
looking around the internet. <laughs> and um, I actually have found, especially in the last five years, right? Um, the ability to identify who's doing this work through Twitter and, you know, sort of almost a snowball effect thinking about like who's doing what work um, is, has been really uh, successful for me, right? So, um, and two is uh, within Ghana, um, again, when I first started about 10 years ago, there were, at least to my awareness, right, not very many people doing STEM education. Uh, but as I identified people, we decided there are nodes of people and we decided, created this thing called the Ghana STEM network. And so they brought different people in, some doing education, some doing entrepreneurship, some doing sort of the intersection like Charles was. And that's how those relationships uh, began to build as we built a platform to communicate it with each other about what we're doing. Olin is slightly different because I'm married to the guy who runs this class. <laughs> so, but that said, we we're still able to leverage those uh, opportunities to, um, to work with their students. And in that case, we're um, just like many universities, right? Have, op have uh, programs that are working overseas, if you will, to be able to identify those because then they have some of the resources that um, I as an organization do not have to be able to leverage, to bring students over, um, to bring resources, but with an aligned goal of actually, we are here not to um, help, right? The, 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 the educators in this case in Ghana, but we know that they have, they just need material support, right? The capacity. Um, they don't have as Ben Linder, guy who runs the class, they don't have all the Lego pieces. So we're just trying to build, bring the right Lego pieces so that they can actually build upon what they already have. Um, in terms of re maintaining relationships, uh, friendship is actually really important. Uh, whenever I go there and even when, you know, my, um, my, my folks go there, we dine together, we meet together, we chat and we're very intentional. And, and I think this is what I learned also from, uh, from my colleagues in Ghana, like that human relationship is really, it's actually foremost, not the transactional professional relationship or not only, I should say. Um, and being really clear about what everybody brings, right? So even in working with Agastya in this, and Olin in this case, um, with Wellesley and when they bring over, we bring a lot of humility to, um, to, our, to our approach and our relationship and make sure that as we say, we're co-creating and we're developing these ideas together. Um, and, and I like that way you say co-creating for capacity, right? It, uh, was at, I think it was a, a com conference. It used to be called the uh, Customer C E S T E M E R in New York, um, and that was the whole idea: co-creating way where you play with other individuals, other organizations, and you find ways. Okay, what is the problem? Yeah. How can we work together? Like the question is, how can we work together? Exactly. To solve this, right? Find your strengths, and then here's what I'll do. Here's what you do. Set those foundations, and then. Yeah. You know, yeah, and work. especially important for, you know, somebody like me coming from the US, I'm like, you know, I, I really don't know your community and your customs. So what do you really need? And, um, and the, even the design challenge, again, you know, it's something that like Charles and I, he would stay in, my, in the apartment that I have in Ghana and we, because, you know, he's a single guy startup, like, you know, couch serving <laughs> so, <laughs> type of thing. And he's like, can I stay over? We're like, yes. And then we talked to like two or three a.m. And, in the night and then we're like you know this is the type of event that you know we want partly because not only it may seem like you know a short-term experience but how do we create hype right mm -hmm. and how do you how do we together create um cultural acknowledgement and change right about people um so that people that students and teachers have around stem right um so hope that answers your question, Rosario. <laughs> and so um, I go to this slide partly again, you know, to again, highlight um, what we, what we see. 
and also to uh, um, to say that you know we we and I have like stabilized our uh, our our um, or our operations in Ghana, if you will. And personally, I think you know I'm slowing it down and possibly stepping away, partly because as, again, as I said, ten years ago when I started. I didn't see a lot happening, and but as I have come to uh, awareness and seen people build organizations and capacities, uh, I feel like you know they really have. They've there's always need, but you know it is right for Ghanaians to be actually uh, uh, to continue this work, right? So I would say you know when I first went, the Ghana Planetarium is probably like the one of the uh, most significant science institutions that were there. And it's been there since like for 20, 30 years, right? Um, Jacob Ashong and his wife, um, uh, Jane, uh, Jacob was white in the Nkrumah ministry at the beginning. He, you know, he's like an amazing scientist, actually a molecular biologist by training, but like, oh, I'm going to start and build an planetarium so they've been running classes and uh and and um doing field trips etc cetera, etc cetera. ghana co club by contrast is the newest thing where um and we've collaborated with them because we don't have we don't have coding curriculum so they are now the technical expertise and we switch roles to be the community experts because we have relationships already in these schools right so um so they've done tremendous work um uh Tina and Asina Apia uh, is a force, and uh, she's doing tremendous work. Uh, Practical Education Network um, started um, actually here at MIT. Um, oh, now I'm blanking on her name. I can see her face, but she's actually moved to Ghana, right? So she's there, and it also um, Heather, Heather. Anyway, she's doing the work. And Practical Sci is uh, in another region and uh, started by um, a local uh, uh, amazing young man who just graduated uh, university about two years ago doing now tremendous work around um, science. And these are the other organizations who are doing similar work. Nova and actually has been a lot of teacher training and even the British Council, et cetera, they have now established new uh, teacher training programs that really focus on hands-on STEM. So a lot of this work is actually happening, right? So um, and really excited. So that's where I'm like, ah, okay, we can maybe step back. Yes, have we followed on students? Let's see. What are some of the impacts? I'll just run through these slides quickly. These are some of the um, questions that Okay, I'll go come back to this if you're interested, but these are the numbers. Um, we haven't really expanded what we're doing since for the last couple of years, and especially this last year because of <laughs> COVID, we, we are not having a design challenge <laughs> this, this coming year. Um, and so these few, the next slides just around, you know, students' perception, right, of their ability and like we said, the confidence, curiosity, et cetera, and some of the indicators that we used. Um, again, these are self-reported and not actually, you know, teacher reports. So take that with a grain of salt, but um, but um, these, these are some of the questions that we've asked, you know, especially the young women who are in our class. Um, uh, this one is says think they can teach younger girls, younger students the same activities. And we've definitely seen them like, hey, our teacher is in a professional development meeting today or some other meeting. And can we just get the keys and get the, get the stuff so that we can actually do our experiments ourselves and get some other kids to come do it? They do that, okay? Um, if they have uh, stuff and the, because a lot of the materials that we also use at the beginning and still use our everyday materials, they sometimes reproduce that and do that as well. Um, and then uh, are they more likely to look at STEM? So one of the things is we're thinking about transfer, right? If they see themselves as a science person, does that transfer to them thinking about themselves more as better students, right, as scholars? Um, and so, um, and of course, you know, in this case, you know, whether they think about uh, whether they would pursue STEM. 
So your question, Rosario, is on point. Partly be, there were two problems that we had with asking this question. We worked with kids who are in upper primary and junior high, right? So that question means, are you going to go to senior secondary school to study science, right? Many of them expressed interest. Yes, we have students, we have teachers who've told us, uh, and we, you know, again, when I have my scientists have like the end is so small, like, <laughs> but like say, you know, there are more kids this year who have, um, who then in the past who have decided that they want to study science. There are two problems that are social. One is there are not that many schools that focus on science in secondary school, which means that if a child decides to, to take science, they may have to leave their home and go to boarding school, which is an expense. Um, and until this, not this year, but the year before, secondary school has fees, right? And regardless whether you are boarding or not. And so that is another disincentive for, for, for kids, uh, for especially, yeah, from lower income families to be able to do that. So we have not been really able to track that. We have one or two examples of young women who have um, gone into um, uh, and taken science, sure. Um, but it, but the tracking has been difficult. And I think tracking is hard enough here when people are doing like college, I mean, high school to college, right, transitions. So that has been hard. We've tried uh, getting to calling parents, right? We've tried um, uh, asking our teachers like, hey, will you re maintain a relationship with your kids? Um, but it's the, the, the tracking has been mixed, unfortunately. Hi, Connie. Um, Hi, Claire. Thank you for the presentation so far. I just had a question. Um, has your organization ever thought about sponsoring one of the students to continue into second year, secondary um, education? Yes, we have thought about it. It's also just a capacity. Right, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so like, you know, if um, the reason we had partnered with um, the organization called CPAS Ghana, at least in the junior high and um, level and, and elementary school is because they were sponsoring kids to go to school. Like, so kids, school is free, but their uniform in the past and like books, et cetera. So they were paying those fees. So we at least knew that kids were staying in school. Um, we had not been able to find a partner um, who does like the subsequent step, but that's actually. Gotcha. No, I was just wondering. So. Yeah, <laughs> Thank you. I mean, there are, but um, no, we, we've thought about it, but we haven't. <laughs> Um, so anyway, so this is again, just mostly self report from the young students. Um, the, yeah, so anyway, so I'll just stop here. These are the people, these uh, Priscilla Awua, um, Christian Saki and Xavier O'Keen are, are on the ground staff who uh, basically monitors and engages with, you know, all the, Moderate evaluate, right? All the teachers that we work with, we work with about 70 teachers and about 20 of them. Uh, in each of the schools, we have a lead teacher who sort of like works closely with um, with uh, with our with our staff. Um, and Isa here is one of the wealthy interns that we've had in the past. So these are super fun people that we work with. And uh, this is our um, advisory board and. Uh, um, Dora, as well as Mimi, has helped me on this end uh, with, um, with some of the work that we do. So basically all the work that we do on this side, the US side is voluntary work. And then, you know, our staff, um, Xavier, Christian and, and, um, and Priscilla, they're our paid staff on the Ghana side. So I will, I think I'll stop there. That's great. Thank you so much, Connie. There's so much in there. And as always, we never have enough time to go through everything. But um, I think you, you gave some questions along the way that would have been good. Any uh, additional questions? Um, I, have, I have a few, but I'll refrain for now. <laughs> All right. I, I realized I had I a, completely gone over. <laughs> I had a question that kind of came up throughout this, and I think you addressed this at certain points. 
too. Um, but in fear of succumbing to the white savior complex, it seems like you're doing a lot of uh, community-based action approach to these problems and having the students go out in their communities and um, identify problems and solutions. Have you uh, found any of this or seen it through social science research to help more initiatives uh, thrive in that sense? Can you elaborate your question whether those types of um, a pro helps the programs, not the participants? Right. Um, I just know there's a whole bunch of social science research that looks at community-based action um, problems where researchers will go out into the communities and help identify, or they'll have the community members identify problems and solutions, and they'll work together, which is basic. It seems like that's exactly what you're doing um, at certain points in the programs. I was just wondering if you based any of those ideas in that foundation of research itself. Not, um, not, not anything specific that I can point to, but certainly um, some of the research that, again, you know, it's done here. I think there's sort of like a positive research about, you know, what whether what works here works in these other mm -hmm. international contexts, right? Um, but there's certainly research here which says, you know, if we show students, especially those from marginalized uh, identities and communities, that uh, where, where if they see science and math as a tool for improving their community, their engagement uh, and, um, and intention to pursue those, uh, those trajectories is higher. So that's sort of like a parallel to what you're saying, but you know, but yeah. is that true for you know, other contexts? Like, I don't think the research, I haven't seen the research. No, definitely, thank you. Mm -hmm. So I was going to add, um, <laughs> good question indeed. I, I was going to ask, so you, you said you were thinking of winding things down a little bit uh, from the exploratory side, given the rise of these other initiatives that are now filling the voids, if you will, right? Um, so, so what does that mean for, I mean, is that a success in a way for, from your end that you've been able to form this partnership? You've seen the, the, the nurturing of these other organizations that are coming through um, that you feel the need to step back? Uh, like, what, what is the ecosystem like now over there? And how are you measuring that to know, like, yeah, I should step back now? <laughs> so a couple of measures, right? I mean, I think, like I said, you know, that the world is still highly inequitable. So there's, <laughs> right? So, you know, un right. until every single child, right, gets those um, opportunities, it's, 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 uh, it's not there. Uh, a couple of, in addition to the number of initiatives that has uh, that has proliferated, the other that I have seen is a more a greater awareness, right, of the inequities within Ghana itself, right, um, for these types of opportunities. Because, frankly, you know, I love my pals, but you know, a lot of them come from highly uh, privileged backgrounds as well, right, and um, and so they're like, oh math quiz and science quiz are awesome but like you know like this is that band of schools that work on that participate right and there's a, a, that is an increasing awareness one um two is um there are problems here for me to work on as well right so one is only so much time in the day and um if, if i think about the expense that it costs me right to fly there and fly back um it's not non-zero and what could that what could that do right for local folks yeah because i think from our end what i've noticed is there's, there's a proliferation we have a we have a, we have a wikipedia page where it's actually cataloging uh it's not actually running by itself all the same initiatives across africa yeah the whole it, yeah. <laughs> yeah and it's still growing and and we're trying to find more and more of them and yeah. and more people adding themselves, it, it, the issue now is becoming sort of ca capacity to support these initiatives because they're all different. They're all doing different things. Some of them are not collaborating, right? Uh, they need funding, they need um, uh, they need so many things, right? And so like, that's where like from our end, uh, we see that the, the issue moving forward in the next 10, 20 years will be in that space. Like how do we enable these local entities to do to do well, like to do to do what they're doing better. Yeah. 
So uh, one, of the, one of the things that I've also, you know, been uh, engaged in and which again is driven by um, our African colleagues is uh, called the African Open Science and Hardware Initiative. And there's an, um, and many of the folks have an education, uh, have education initiatives that maybe make us fake, maker space based, but also thinking about like, you know, how do they develop, how are they developing uh, materials and resources that are suitable, right, for for their communities? Because frankly, like, hey, some of the microscopes that we bring over are not because, because of environmental conditions, frankly, right? Um, and so, um, and, uh, and, and I see these networks and we've had a couple of summits of course you know this year was not possible because of covid um where people have, are beginning to come together and thinking about like and regional networks right because that's where again you know how do you not have to fly people like thousands of miles <laughs> or hundreds of miles uh um to be able to come together and so and and i completely agree with you right it's the infrastructure right nobody mm -hmm. like most people like to do the fun stuff, and but how do you get the back end um, uh, in a way that people can communicate with each other? And frankly, like WhatsApp is an amazing platform for collaboration other than in person. Yeah, exactly. And this is the thing too, it can be fun. I think making these connections and connecting the dots and saying, you know, A should talk to B because uh, mm -hmm. you guys can fix C. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And we had like had yeah, fun with no. Agapia because we see that as a South-South collaboration, right? Because we're just, Olin and, mm -hmm. the, and the exploratory in some way is actually just making a uh, uh, intellectual transfer from the South. That's, that's horrible. Well, that's not necessarily US-based, just US-mediated. Um, any other questions uh, from attendees here? Uh, I'm not seeing any from our virtual, as you say, live stream people at this time. But um, yeah. So, 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 just in terms of closing, um, is it that the exploratory will be shutting down, or are you, or, or, or you envision it changing into something else? Uh, we're we're still having those conversations. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, hey, if anybody is interested, <laughs> you know, we've, we've also talked about like, hey, can, you know, college groups adopt some of the clubs, etc. like Claire, what you're saying, right? But instead of, you know, uh, um, because it, and thinking about, you know, like what are the collaborations, right, that could be had? I think this is a, it, we don't really talk about these things, right, where, you know, has it, has it ran its course in a way or are you now uh, morphing into something else, right? We just use the CB endpoint, like, oh, this is where we are now. But um, um, thank you for letting us in your thinking and, you know, the journey so far, uh, uh, as, as we are also just making our way through through this. Yeah, yeah, it is true. Like, we don't think we'd like, we start a thing. It's like, when is it going to end? <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I mean, I feel real. I, 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 we could wrap up, but I mean, I, I, the fact that, you know, even as our teachers are transferring to different schools and sort of outside of our immediate impact, they are requesting like, can I run, is it okay if I run a similar club here, right? At one new school, that sort of, you know, the sort of organic dissemination that we, we are looking to have. And, you know, in, in some of the design challenges, one which we ran with the ministry or one component of the ministry, we're saying like, it's possible for you to do this. So why don't you take it and run? So it's sort of like proof of concept type, um, type of uh, not quite turnkey, but kind of turnkey approach, right? That can be prolific because then you don't have to be there all the time, right? You've, you've, you've enabled that, you know, and built capacity, as you say, mm -hmm. co-created capacity. And I think that's the long-term impact that it's hard to track and you need to somehow find a way to track it. Right? All of us are trying this. It's really difficult, but um, but yeah, but thank you so much, Connie. That was, that, was, that was wonderful. And I'm sure we're probably gonna have you back uh, for something else and chatting, you know, <laughs> to our fellows. Yeah, I'd love or, to hear more about your project. Uh, also. Yeah, there's so many, yeah, there's many different, all our residents are working on different yep. projects. And, and so 
Um, we're definitely going to keep in touch. And with that, uh, that concludes our 2020 seminar series. Connie, thank you for anchoring us at the end there. And look out for 2021 and all the new talks from our residents and our uh, guest speakers. And also the fellows program is looking for um, the, the C5. These are cohort five fellows. Uh, our application is open now. Uh, the program starts in March. And also at summer interns, the application is open as well. Uh, that program starts in June. So if you're uh, your students or yourself are interested, go to our website, stemadvocacy.org to check us out. And with that, thank you and have a good Saturday, everybody.